next door, so I'm no stranger to the beauty of northern New Mexico, and uh, I love being down here. But, um, and I have been to Las Vegas. I have yet to stop by the uh, NRA shooting camp in Raton, where, where you can shoot a musket and a machine gun for the same price. So, uh, but it is, uh, in Colorado, we, uh, it, you know, we're, we're considered a, a must-win state for the two presidential candidates, so we're just completely pummeled now by these, these nasty uh, ads, and uh, it is, uh, it's just kind of stunning why, uh, you know, what, what is it that people are organizing? How do people fight this? Uh, there's been a lot of activity uh, against Citizens United at the grassroots level, and fundamentally, uh, when the Supreme Court takes such a strong position in support of, of uh, something, it's very hard. And, and so there's a, now an effort nationally, and I'm sure there are people here working on it, uh, to make an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, but how do you do that when the Congress, which ultimately enacts such an amendment, is so corrupt? Well, it has to be done at the very grassroots. There's a mechanism in the Constitution for a grassroots amendment. It's like, I believe it's never been done. Uh, but the situation has become so grave that there's now something called move to amend. And it will be the ultimate, kind of the mother of all grassroots efforts in this democracy uh, to save it or to sell it. So uh, we've been watching that. The energy extraction industries have provoked a massive upsurge in grassroots activity. And so we you know, cannot travel someplace where there isn't, uh, there is not acti uh, organizing and action against fracking. And so I'm not surprised to hear that it's happening uh, here as well. Uh, even in western Wisconsin, where there's no shale that's yet been discovered to exploit, uh, we found out that people are very concerned about fracking. Why? Because the fracking fluid, which is largely secret stew of toxins uh, the, uh, with the addition of scarce water, has also uh, what some people call silica or sand in it. Well, you'd think sand is a fairly kind of generic item, but it's actually a particular type of sand that is native to western Wisconsin and the banks of the upper uh, Mississippi River. And so, believe it or not, there's massive extraction of sand happening up there that's uh, just completely raping the land, disturbing, uh, you know, vital and uh, ecosystems along the Mississippi, and alarming people there to the extent we're trying to figure out in western Wisconsin, how can we protect our sand? And that's how bad it's got, and that is part of this national movement uh, to ban fracking. On October 23rd in Colorado, in Denver, there's going to be a statewide rally uh, for frack-free Colorado, uh, and it's just it's something that's so interesting to see uh, as it as it kind of moves towards a unified national movement because the people are making connections, award-winning documentaries are getting made, uh, and the news uh, that you know we try to cover it as much and as as thoroughly as we can on Democracy Now. Um, all that is to say, I, I started. Uh, by mentioning Harry Belafonte, and I learn, as you will learn, by listening to Amy Goodman, that every good digression deserves another. And so, we can <laughs> what's remarkable about Amy is, you know, she does the news with such precision and such discipline. Um, and you hear her on the show. There's not a lot, a huge expression of her wit. Tonight, you'll enjoy her wit as I do every week while working on this column with her. Uh, but uh, the. The book that we have has been out. Um, it's only. It's really just hitting the stores now. We um, we had to delay the publication. We felt because uh, as it was in the printer, uh, we have a, a very nimble and able nonprofit publisher called Haymarket Books, uh, named after the movement that brought us the eight-hour workday. Uh, a union print shop, uh, but uh, ultimately it was in the print shop as the Aurora massacre happened. Uh, so uh, Amy and I asked them to just hold off. We're writing a column about the Aurora massacre, and then the massacre of the Sikhs at their temple in Wisconsin happened. Uh, all this happened as we were going to Basque Country in Spain, 
Amy was invited to an event to commemorate the 75th uh, anniversary of the mass slaughter of civilians at, in the town of Guernica. Uh, and it turns out we learned there that not only was the town completely decimated, the village destroyed, the businesses and residences, the packed market square bombed uh, during the Spanish Civil War, but uh, the rail line was perfectly preserved and the three arms plants that abutted the rail lines were also left untouched and working at full capacity for General Franco. So uh, we saw this kind of confluence of small arms and then to put the cap on it, the Obama administration scuttled a UN arms control treaty that had a huge part of a, a section on blocking uh, the illegal transfer of small arms. So within the, those four columns, we felt that we could uh, shoehorn in necessarily a, a, a chapter on, on small arms and, 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 and gun violence. And our publisher uh, accomplished that. And you'll notice it's at the very end of the book, because when a book is sitting there ready to be printed, uh, the index is already made. You can't really mess with it too much. Uh, so they kind of slip them in at the back end. And, and we're grateful for that, uh, albeit for such uh, sad reasons, but it was important. Um, so at any rate, the book is just out. Amy's had um, the tremendous support of all of you in the past with uh, getting this book out. The, we hope that it, uh, like her other ones, hits various bestseller lists so that it ripples out beyond the walls of this room uh, to the libraries, to the regions that don't have community media uh, or, or even uh, the imminent community media that you have here, uh, but into the hinterlands, into the library shelves, the bookshelf, the school shelves, and, and the remaining bookstores. So uh, I mention that because when um, Juan Gonzalez released or was, was about to release his uh, latest book, News for All the People, the Epic Story of Race in the American Media, which just, it's a fascinating book just out in paperback. I, he asked me to help him on a tour, and unlike a 100-city tour, he's like, absolutely nothing like Amy's tours. I want nothing like that. We have 10 days at the most. Let's see what we can do. And it was really fun traveling with Juan and his co-author, Joe Torres. Uh, but uh, because it was such a limited amount of time, uh, we and, and Juan acceded to quite a number of my requests for some harebrained events. Uh, we did a 7 a.m. event or an 8 a.m. event at a bookstore in Santa Cruz that you know, drew a, a close to 200 people. Uh, but the book did hit the bestseller list, and I mention it because it was one below Harry Belafonte's memoir. <laughs> and it, by appearing there, it managed to push down Dick Cheney's memoir by a lot. But again, it's really about uh, kind of leveraging the incredible journalism that Amy and her producers at Democracy Now! managed to churn out day after day uh, into different forums, whether it's a podcast or a web distribution platform like SoundCloud, or whether it's in the papers that we reach out to with these columns that are collected here. Uh, and so that was really, uh, so it's our hope that we can do the same uh, because uh, both the op-ed pages where these papers appear and typically the bestseller list, uh, they're just uh, kind of the, the, a, a very stronghold of uh, establishment and oftentimes reactionary perspectives. And, and we have to do what we can to, uh, to, ch to change that. So uh, with that, I want to just offer one brief intro to Amy that I did not write. It was written by a friend of hers and it relates to a trip they took in the 1980s, and it's the foreword to the book. Um, it's by a filmmaker. We know him as a filmmaker. He describes their travels together in the late 80s before he released his first film, uh, and that's Michael Moore. <laughs> Michael writes in the foreword to The Silence Majority, I first met Amy Goodman in the first month of the first Palestinian Intifada. It's where I usually go to meet people. <laughs> you throw an Intifada, I'm there. <laughs> and so is Amy. In fact, if you're in the middle of any sort of rebellion, uprising, or you're just getting revolution, or you're just getting the familiar everyday ass whooping by forces that seem much greater than yours, that is where you'll find the fearless Amy Goodman. 
It's safe to say that she lives by the promise Tom Joad made to his mother at the end of Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. I'll be everywhere. Wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat, I'll be there. Wherever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. If there's one thing you can trust, it's that Amy Goodman will always be there. The weeks we spent together on the West Bank and Gaza were, to say the least, quite harrowing, and yet they had a profound impact on both of us. It was just after Christmas, 1987, and the Palestinian people had decided to rise up and resist their Israeli minders with protests, civil disobedience, and stones. Stones! Ah, remember the days of stones? Such an innocent time it was back then. <laughs> Ralph Nader had asked a group of us, mostly writers and journalists, to go over to the occupied territories and bring back to the American public the truth about what was really going on. Little did we know that we would be witnessing the first weeks of what sadly is now a 25-year-long resistance. Here's the dominant image in my head of Amy Goodman during that month in Palestine. When the Israeli soldiers started firing their rubber bullets at us and a group of unarmed Palestinians, we would all run the other way, i.e. away from the bullets. And Amy Goodman would be running the opposite way, straight into the melee. She appeared as if she were invisible, and while I do not want to imply she's some sort of superhero with supernatural powers, I will say that I'm glad she's on our side, and leave it at that. Two years later, in 1990, Amy Goodman and fellow journalist Alan Nairn traveled to East Timor to cover their independence movement, and it was there that she personally witnessed the murder and massacre of 270 Timorese civilians by the Indonesian army. And for bearing witness to this horrific event, she and Alan were beaten by the army officials. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be present while 270 people are being killed. But there was Amy again on the front lines, searching out the truth and at great personal risk. Amy is a serious journalist who has won many of the nation's top journalism honors, including the George Polk Award, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, among others. Amy's daily television and radio show, Democracy Now!, soon to be carried on KCEI. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> is currently in its 16th year. How on earth she and her remarkable team pulled this together day after day is beyond me. When I did a weekly TV show, Michael Moore writes, I wanted to throw myself into the East River at the end of every show. <laughs> and I actually, uh, Jeremy Scahill worked on that show, uh, The Awful Truth, and I also did one episode with him, and I could see the incredible frustration that, uh, that was caused. So it was, uh, if any of you saw the, uh, the New Hampshire primary a uh, mosh pit that was designed to attract uh, or to deter the campaign of Steve Forbes. That was our, that was our work. Uh, I have been on her show, Michael Moore continues, many times, and I have seen backstage the incredible professional operation that they have over there in downtown Manhattan. I don't know if they give tours like they do at NBC, but I would put the Democracy Now! headquarters on any intelligent tourist's must-see list. Has anyone here seen the new studios? Well, there's, you're all welcome. Come on by. This book is a collection of, many's, of, of many of Amy's commentaries and columns over the past years. It is fascinating reading a true chronicle of our times and a real head shaker as you read it and wonder, how is it we're still here? Back in early 1988, as we traveled the back roads of the West Bank, going from one village to another, there was much that we saw that would make even the most committed among us give up hope, beset with the knowledge that true justice seemed like a faraway destination. After all, this was a struggle between a massive military machine that had nuclear weapons and children with slingshots. Who wins that fight? Well, there was a day a long, long time ago that the press people had a young boy with a slingshot, and that boy used that slingshot, and for that, his people would be free. So we didn't leave Palestine in total despair. In fact, we were deeply inspired by the will and determination of the people we met, people who had nothing, people who were in it for the long haul, and who had no intention of giving up. It was a good lesson for us to learn. It would be another two years before I would release my first film, Roger and Me, and it would be eight more years before Democracy Now! would go on the air. We became committed to doing our best with the slingshots we have. And that was kindly written by Michael Moore 
and I can't think of any other way to compliment it by then other than asking you to join me in welcoming Amy Goodman.